All right, let's continue our journey through diagnostic procedures for microbe infections. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, immunofluorescence testing. Uh, fluorescent antibody testing, or FADS, uh, is looking for monoclonal antibodies that have been labeled with a fluorescent dye. Uh, you can do this through direct testing. Uh, if you have an unknown test specimen or antigen uh, is fixed to a slide, and exposed to these fluorescent antibody solutions. If the antigen antibody complex is formed, they will remain bound to the sample and can be visualized using fluorescent microscopy. Uh, this is a valuable technique for identifying and locating microbial antigens on cell surfaces or tissues and in identifying the causative agents of things like syphilis, gonorrhea, and meningitis. Uh, here is a, again, artist rendering of a tube with the sera in it. They place the, excuse me, uh, fluorescent antigens in, uh, then take a sample, put it on a microscope slide, look at it using fluorescent microscopy, and you will see that the spirochete has been attached with these uh, fluorescent dyes showing the organism again. And this is the causative agent of syphilis. Uh, indirect testing, the FABs can recognize the constant region of an antibody uh, in the patient's serum. Uh, the known antigen is added to a test serum. Uh, the binding of the fluorescent antibody is visualized again through fluorescence microscopy. Uh, the aggregates or cells will indicate which of the fluorescent uh, antibodies have complex with microbe uh, specific antibodies. And we use this again to diagnose syphilis and other various viral infections. Uh, enzyme link immunosorbent assay. This is the test that we do on this campus in lab as a simulated HIV test. It uses an enzyme linked indicator antibody to visualize the antigen antibody reaction. Uh, it re re relies on a solid support structure. Uh, in this case, a micro titer plate that can adsorb the reactants. Uh, the ELISA is an indirect test. Uh, it detects the microbe specific antibodies found within a patient's sera. Uh, the known antigen is adsorbed to the surface of a cell and mixed with an unknown antibody. Oh, that's the surface of a well. Uh, if the antigen antibody complex formed, uh, an added indicator antibody will bind and produce a specific color change. Uh, these are common tests to determine uh, antibody screening for HIV, uh, various rickettsial diseases, hepatitis A and C, and heliobacter organisms. Uh, because false positive tests can occur with this, a verification test with a western blot may be necessary. Uh, again, what is done for HIV, for instance, uh, we will run this test. If it gets positive, we will run the ELISA a second time to verify that positive. Uh, and then once we have two positives in a row, we will then send it on for Western blot testing, Western blot testing for a verification of the result. Uh, a direct ELISA is a known antibody is adsorbed to the bottom of a well and incubated with an unknown antigen. If the antigen antibody complex forms, it will attract the indicator antibody and color will develop in these wells. Uh, this is the type of test used uh, to detect things like hantavirus, rubella virus, and toxoplasma. Uh, the newest detection systems use computer chips to sense minute changes in electrical currents that occur when antigen antibody complexes are formed. And we will talk a little bit more about these new computer chip tests here in just a moment. Uh, but here's the indirect ELISA. Again, this is the one we do here on our campus. Uh, this is the direct ELISA. Uh, this one actually requires an incubation time. This one does not. Uh, this one simply requires uh, a few more steps in the processing. 
In vivo testing are tests that employ principles similar to serological tests, but the antigen or antibody is introduced to a patient to elicit a visible reaction. And in vivo testing, we're working inside the body, and in the ELISA test, we are working in that little micro titer plate. A uh, classic example of this is the tuberculin reaction, uh, where a small amount of purified protein derivative uh, from the microbacterium tuberculosis organism is injected into the skin. If you've ever had a TB skin test, uh, if you work in the uh, medical field, for instance, uh, or maybe you just had to have a test for some other reason, uh, this is what's going. This is the type of test it is, uh, and it is an in vivo testing. Uh, the appearance of a red raised thickened lesion uh, in 48 to 72 hours can indicate a previous exposure to tuberculosis. Uh, immune testing, the most effective diagnostic tests that have a high degree of specificity and sensitivity uh, are these types of tests. A specificity is the property of a test to focus only on a certain antigen or antibody and not react with unrelated or distantly related antigens. Sensitivity uh, detects even minute quantities of antibodies and antigens. Uh, this is going to reflect the degree to which a test will detect every positive person. So you want a high degree of specificity and a high degree of sensitivity. Uh, polymerase chain reaction, we've been hearing a lot about PCR lately. Uh, PCR results in the production of numerous identical copies of a DNA or RNA molecule uh, within just a few hours. Uh, it can amplify even minute quantities of nucleic acids pres present in a sample. Uh, Real-time PCR, uh, also known as qPCR or quantitative PCR, uh, uses fluorescent labeling during the application, amplification process. Uh, the level of fluorescence is measured in real time as the reaction is running. Uh, it is fully automated and faster than traditional PCR because analysis of the DNA after the reaction is finished is not necessary. Uh, often, uh, this will assess the antimicrobial susceptibilities at the same time as identifying the organism. Uh, multiplex PCR contains primers for multiple organisms in the, dif the differential diagnosis for the patient's symptoms. And most often, multiplex PCR is also real-time PCR. Um, COVID-19 testing, this is the type of uh, test that was given by the government, by the CDC, uh, to test for SARS-CoV-2, commonly referred to as COVID-19. Uh, it, it detects viral RNA, and this is what the test would look like when it's open. You would have the three vials, each vial containing a different part of the test. Hybridization makes it possible to identify a microbe by analyzing segments of its genetic material, uh, probes, are small segments of DNA or RNA known to be complementary to the specific sequence of the nucleic acids, which is isolated from a microbe. So we have a small piece of DNA and RNA that we know will bind at a particular place on the looked for antigen. Uh, base pairings of probes, nucleic acids can provide evidence of microbes identity. If we know what organism has things where, and this is a binding, then we know what organism we're dealing with. The probes are then fluorescently labeled to an enzyme that triggers a color change when this hybridization occurs. Uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization, or FISH. Again, probes that have been labeled with fluorescent dyes are applied to intact cells within a patient specimen or an environmental sample. We have microscopic analysis or automated processes will be used to locate the glowing cells and conclude the identity of the microbe. Uh, these are often used to confirm a diagnosis or to identify the microbial components within a biofilm. The hybridization tests can be used in cancer diagnosis. 
uh, especially in personalized medicine. Uh, this is the biggest growing field in cancer uh, treatment today is what is referred to as personalized medicine. Uh, where a patient's DNA is examined for particular characteristics that can make a certain drug a better choice for them. Literally, drugs can be designed to match the patient's DNA. Again, uh, peptide nucleic acid fishing. Uh, here's the staph aureus found on the slide. So we start with the bacterial culture. We lay that out on the slide. We apply the DNA probe, which is going to uh, excuse me, the PNA probe for Staph aureus, along with the Staph aureus ribosomes. Uh, and if in 90 minutes, we start to have these glowing Staph aureus colonies, then we know that this blood sample contains gram-positive cocci, and that gram-positive cocci is, in fact, Staph aureus. Microarrays, or chips, contain gene sequences from potentially thousands of different possible infectious agents. Uh, these arrays are elected based on large differential diagnoses. Uh, the arrays can be made to contain bacterial, viral, uh, and or fungal genes in a single test. Uh, matching the sequences or matching sequences will hybridize on the chip and fluoresce if detected by a computer program. So you get the right, you put a, several different arrays of organisms on there. If hybridization occurs and if the fluorescing shows on the computer program, then you know that that sera or that serum from the patient contains the particular agent you're looking for. And here are the microarrays showing different uh, growth patterns and then the computer doing the analyzing. Uh, and there's, again, I don't want to be the guy to have to analyze that. Luckily for us, uh, we don't have to do the analyzing. The computer actually does the analyzing for us. Uh, whole genome sequencing uh, is useful for rapid analysis of outbreaks and for drug-resistant organisms. A single genome can be scanned and analyzed multiple times in a process called deep sequencing. Uh, this deep sequencing is going to minimize errors. Uh, it may be uh, make a mistake one time, but it won't make a mistake multiple times more than likely. So we eliminate our errors. Uh, and it is, it is suspected that over the next 15 to 20 years, this type of testing will become so cheap and routine uh, that we'll soon sequence everything from a patient sample to find the microbes causing the symptoms. It won't be a hit and miss where we look for this, and then later we look for this, then later we look for this. We just look for everything all up front, all up front. Uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis or microbial fingerprints, uh, similar to DNA fingerprinting. We've all seen on the cop shows uh, in the Maury Povich when he says who the daddy is. Uh, we know about genetic fingerprinting. Uh, but pulse field gel electrophoresis involves separating DNA fragments that are too large for conventional gel electrophoresis method. Uh, it is accomplished by slowly applying alternating voltage levels to the gel from three different directions. In other words, you're pulling it front to back, left to right, up and down. Uh, it allows similarly sized DNA fragments to separate. Uh, the DNA is then subjected to restriction enzymes, so single changes in DNA sequences will result in different sized fragments. Uh, and these are often used in acute outbreaks of foodborne diseases and other types of infections. PulseNet is a program established by the CDC to assist in the investigation of possible disease outbreaks caused by foodborne pathogens. Scientists from public health facilities across the country are able to rapidly communicate and compare PFGE, pulse field gel electrophoresis data. Uh, indication of outbreaks can occur within hours versus days or weeks for identification of these outbreaks. And the CDC is in the process of transitioning their PulseNet system to using whole genome sequencing uh, to make it that much quicker. And then there's the pulse field gel electrophoresis. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you see the melted agarose added to make a solid plug. And then it's subject to lysis, restriction enzymes, and then we get 
our multiple different whole steel generated electrophoresis. Uh, lab on a chip. This is the next phase. Uh, within the next few years, this will be commonplace uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, many genetic tests have been miniaturized and placed on chips, uh, integrated circuits. Uh, these are easy to use, require very few samples or supplies, uh, very little technical training. Uh, basically, you teach somebody to take a urine sample, drop it right there, or drop it, excuse me, down here. That's the circuit board that's actually running all the tests. Drop the sample down here, uh, put it in the machine, and the machine does the work for you. Uh, it is available in both DNA and RNA sequencing methods, as well as PCR methods. Uh, its biggest impact will be on developing countries. Uh, it is in those countries where diagnosis is often not possible because of a lack of supplies, lack of expertise, lack of refrigeration required to store an array of diagnostic. This does not have to be refrigerated. All this needs uh, is a little bit of an electrical current which can be provided by a Honda generator uh, and then have somebody PP on that sample right there or take a blood smear and put it on there and put it in the machine and it does the work for you and will tell you what, what is causing the particular patient's ailment. Uh, mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry uh, is a rapid and highly accurate microbial identification method. Uh, it will do its job within minutes. Uh, it is used to analyze a protein fingerprint from a pure culture isolates or directly from samples isolated from patient specimens. Uh, it involves adding the patient sample to a metal plate and then striking it with a laser. That laser ionizes the sample, which allows the ions from the sample to be identified by their mass to charge ratio. Uh, can simultaneously detect antibody, antibiotic susceptibilities as well. Uh, there is a mass spec uh, showing, excuse me, different peaks. And if you have the chart, you know, each one of these peaks is, represents a different organism. And then you see here's a common peak here between the non-infected and the slightly infected. And then here, the heavily infected patient down here. Uh, imaging in the form of x-rays has been used for centuries in the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Uh, MRI, CT scans, and PET scans have been increasingly uh, employed to find areas of localized infections in deep tissues. Uh, these types of tests, as they are improved, can save patients from an invasive biopsy. I know if I had a spot on my lung and they could look at it using an MRI, I'd a whole lot rather than do that than do a needle biopsy and pull a sample out of my lung. Uh, some entirely new diagnostic strategies. Uh, one strategy uses patient's blood to check for the presence of seven genes uh, that the host cell expresses in response to bacterial but not viral infections. Uh, if those seven genes are active, then the prescriber knows to prescribe an antibiotic. If they are not active, then the symptoms are caused by a virus, therefore cannot be helped by antibiotics. Uh, this is an incredibly useful tool in a world where the majority of antibiotic prescriptions are incorrectly prescribed for conditions that are not caused by bacteria. That the majority of antibiotic prescriptions are incorrectly prescribed. Researchers at Stanford University who developed this blood test are working to make it more than more like lab on a chip technology so that it can be quick and easy to use in all kinds of conditions. So uh, the, the two newest state newest things, lab on a chip and where is it called? What is it called? Anyway, the way we're testing for all oh, this seven gene technology. Again, seven genes are active. You've got a bacterial infection. Seven genes are not active. And if that could be uh, developed and used uh, cost effectively, uh, much lowering the, the amount of antibiotic prescriptions that are written, uh, we may not be having to pr produce new antibiotics uh, every other year 
uh, maybe only every 10 years or so. Okay. That wraps up chapter 15. Uh, we'll see you next time we are together. Everybody have a great day.